We're going to do things a little differently today than we've done before. Uh, this is the first webinar in a series of four. So today is going to be a brief overview of the capabilities. I won't be demonstrating the ease of use or any picks and clicks, really, but just results of previously run studies. Uh, if you're just here to see what SOLIDWORKS 12 can do, this is a webinar for you. If anything piques your interest, please register for one of the upcoming in-depth webinars, which I'll talk about in a minute, moment or two here. Or we can provide a more in-depth custom demonstration for you. Uh, feel free to ask, and we'll do that. With that housekeeping out of the way, let's move on to the presentation. How often do you fully understand the mechanics of something you design? I'm assuming if you're designing something where geometry is the only concern, you can nail it almost every time. If it just has to mate with other parts, it's not hard, right? We could simulate everything we need to just in CAD. If I need to design the drill jig, I can do it like nobody's business. I know where to put the bearing. I can find the tolerances for the hole. I can design it so when it's made, you press the bearing in, and there it goes. But what about when things are more complicated? If it's a cast bracket with lots of geometry constraints, maybe it has to bend around an oil filter or keep out of the way of a control arm but it also has to carry certain loads, that becomes much harder to figure out what's right. We'll typically use FEA or simulation for that. Or in a more relevant case to our flow topic, how about a manifold? How do you know that it's going to let the proper amount of fluid through or balance it out as you want it to be? Is it gonna be 90% in the first port and 10% in the last or 25, 25, 25, 25 in all four? In many companies, the effects of fluid flow are either guessed at or it's determined through trial and error, sometimes just ignored. If you're lucky, you might have a similar bracket that you can, or similar manifold in this case, that you can start with. And I know it doesn't always make sense to run a fluid flow analysis, but sometimes good engineering requires at least knowing that the options are available. So today, I'm hoping to give you an overview of the three most common uses of SOLIDWORKS flow and let you know that they are available if ever you should feel the need to use them. And that didn't advance the slide like it was supposed to. So we'll start with fluid, internal fluid flow. This is the kind of study that would be most relevant to designers of valves, manifolds, piping systems. In today's overview, I'll examine a poppet valve that was designed five years ago without the use of any flow software. I'll be able to see now how the fluid moves through the valve, the pressure losses in the valve, the areas that cause the pressure, and how much flow it restricts. Uh, I've got somebody who can't hear anything. Krista, are you still hearing me? We can hear you. Okay. Um, so how much flow it restricts. In the second webinar of this four-part series, Nick Pusateri, uh, one of our applications engineers, will examine fluid flow much more in depth when he studies the design of the Venturi system, which is used for combining two chemicals into a fluid, single fluid stream. Think of soap into a car wash nozzle or concentrated um, pesticides into a sprayer for an orchard. That webinar, I believe, is at 11 a.m. on May 22nd. Watch your emails for that. Next, we're going to be looking at um, printed circuit boards, how heat's generated and how it's dissipated. Sorry, I lost my spot there. <laughs> uh, in this segment, we'll explore a few of the ways in which SOLIDWORKS can help us understand how the heat is generated and dissipated in a simple circuit board, which then ultimately leads to better design and a few design, fewer design iterations and product issues. I can speak from experience here. When I was making circuit boards, if we made a board, by the time we brought it in, tested it, had to make a new design, had to wait for a new circuit board to come in, got it populated, it was probably a two to three week experiment. Here we'll be able to go through probably 20 iterations in a day if we're ambitious. So if this interests you, after you've seen the overview, we have an upcoming webinar with our simulation expert, Drew Buchanan, and our PCB expert, Mark Talbot. They will showcase how SOLIDWORKS Flow and SOLIDWORKS PCB work very well together 
and allow for quick and easy iterations and testing of simulation. Finally, we'll get to the fun part of FEA, or sorry, CFD. At least when I think of it, I always think of aerodynamics. So whether it's a Formula One race car, a fighter jet, or a kayak rack on top of a car, there are always fun things that we can do. The SOLIDWORKS flow can be used to eliminate some of the unnecessary drag in all of those things, predict noise generation. I once drove down the road with a ladder on top of my car at 80 miles per hour, and this thing made a terrific racket the whole time. We can model that, simulate it, come up with ways to eliminate it or at least mitigate it. And so for this demo, I'm going to run a CFD or a flow analysis on a paper airplane, just because I've always wanted to. If you ever get me talking, uh, I do claim to hold the world record for a long paper airplane flight, although it wasn't documented by Guinness. I still think I have it. So if this is your cup of tea, but you're interested in something a little more complex than a paper airplane, we have a fourth webinar with our senior applications engineer, Ken Victor. It's June 3rd, again at 11 a.m., and watch your emails for that. So with the overview out of the way, let's jump into SOLIDWORKS and take a look at some of the results you can get. This is that valve I talked about. You see it modeled here with two pieces of pipe on either end. We'll do that in a simulation because it allows us to understand better what happens on both sides and allow the fluid to develop uh, before it gets to the valve and after it passes through the valve. So to begin with, my biggest constraint from the customer with this valve was how much fluid can we push through it? And I need a comparison. So I've created a simple piece of pipe, ran an analysis on it, and just as easy as this, as I show the results, Oh, you can see 279 inches cubed per second is how much flow exits this pipe under the, the input conditions of 65 PSI, which is 50 PSI plus atmosphere roughly, and atmosphere on the other side. So with 279 to begin with, how much flow goes through this? 58 inches cubed. If you do the math, that's about an 80% loss in flow capacity going through this valve. So probably something that could have benefited from a few iterations before it was put into production. The way this valve works is flow comes from the left-hand side up through here. And when this is pressurized, the spring is compressed, the plunger is out of the way, and the flow makes the U-turn and comes back out this side. When the upper chamber isn't pressurized, the piston comes down, plugging the hole and stops the flow. So we know that we're losing 80% of the flow rate. We can take a look at where that happens by creating a cut plot. And here I have some turbulence, both in, I think that's the XY plane and the XZ plane that I can show. Turbulent flow is generally not ideal if you're trying to preserve pressure. But we can get into that in more detail. Sometimes it is ideal, but this is where our pressure loss is occurring. You'll see that we have a very large area here. If I zoom in on it, you'll see that the flow is actually going in reverse. We're only utilizing about half of the pipe in this area, which makes some sense as to why we're losing so much pressure. But you can also see where this turn happens, there's a lot of uh, high turbulence areas. And one of my favorite things that I can actually see here is if I show this pressure profile, not only is it color coded to show the pressure from absolute zero pressure to uh, 63 point whatever PSI, I've turned on the 3D profile option. So it graphically represents that the pressure starts out high, enters the valve and drops rapidly, and then comes back out and starts to stabilize again. You can see the variation in pressures all over the place. 
within the valve, and also this spot here where it drops almost to zero, if not to zero, that tells me that there's cavitation going on there. The water is actually boiling because the pressure is so low. Uh, that can cause problems, especially in pumps and things, but the valves, it's not always our favorite idea either. So areas for improvement. And I have a couple of velocity profiles as well here. Again, this is 3D, and you can see that the water really picks up speed as it comes here, but then the water almost directly adjacent to it is not moving at all. So if I were going to design this again, I would try to make this a much more curved or smooth curve. And before we go, doesn't like that for some reason. Before we go, we can take a look at an XY plot. I drew a sketch from the left to the right. And if I show that, you'll see that we have, as we saw in that pressure profile, a very stable pressure. It hits the valve and drops to another stable pressure eventually. So we can see that our pressure drop here is roughly 65 minus 15. So somewhere in the neighborhood of 50 PSI drop over that valve. Little housekeeping there. Moving on to our second topic for today. If you've done the SOLIDWORKS flow training, you might recognize this as lesson three, electronics cooling. But we're going to use it today as a opportunity for some VAVE. If you're not familiar with that term, it means uh, value and analyst and value and value analysis and value engineering. It's an automotive term for saving money. Imagine this design came to you. Presumably, you're a mechanical engineer. And they've asked you to reduce some costs out of it. Most mechanical engineers are experts in the electronics. So what do you look at? Can we take the metal out of it? Well, what about this fan here? So there's two fans in the design. Maybe you've pulled the data sheet or you talked to an electrical engineer and they say, well, we need to keep the part in the below the heat sink at or below 60 degrees Celsius. So you run initially an analysis with the two fans. We have a pressure map here, not pressure, temperature map here. That shows we're at 53 degrees with both fans on. If we've got a target of 60 degrees, we can start to look at other fans as well, knowing that perhaps this is too many fans. I can also turn on these flow trajectories to show me how air is flowing through here. And I can see a little hard, but if I turn off flow one, you'll see I have some flow going over the heat sink. And if I turn off flow two, then you'll see that I have almost no flow over the heat sink. In the book, um, the training book, we use just one fan. Oops, didn't mean to do that. Wrong button. I have to load the results here. You'll see that the pressure is just below, the temperature is just below 60 degrees, and our flow is very little going over that. Now, we're still at 60 degrees. You might question, well, what if we ran it with no fan? And as you can imagine, it's going to get hotter, but unless you're more of an expert than I am, I can't tell you how much hotter until I look at this and say, well, 160 degrees with 100 degrees Celsius rise in temperature, that's probably an issue. Um, I'm going to need to have a fan. So finally, we'll look at the 
one that seems most intuitive probably to everybody on the phone call, I hope. And having the fan over where it blows more air over the heat sink. And there we have almost the same temperature as we had with two fans with just one fan. So if that fan costs 60 cents or a dollar, you've just made a case for removing that fan from this assembly and saving some money. We were able to review uh, four different iterations within the matter of probably four minutes, where building these out and trying them would take a little while longer, for sure. And one of the other things that I found very interesting that can be used within SolidWorks flow is this flux pot. You have to make it a little bigger so we can all see it here. So what this does, and it's usually a little messy and you got to organize it, is maps where all the heat is going. So from the power that's being dumped into the heat sink, of the three watts, you can see that 1.48 or 1.49 watts is getting transferred into the air. But 1.5 watts is getting dumped right into the PCB or the, the printed circuit board. So if that, you're actually getting a little bit of heat from the other components as well. Um, if you start seeing that heat is transferring from one part into the other, you can maybe move it farther from a part that has a higher temperature or a lower temperature constraint than the one that's running hotter and transferring heat where you don't want it. You can take a look at the second one as well. I think I played with that. This shows all the components. You can see this one's a little messier, but again, with some creative moving things around, you can start to figure out how heat moves through this system, just like we could the other one. Now moving on to what I call the fun one. This is a paper airplane. I got it off GrabCAD. Um, great place to get stuff. Made a few modifications in these iterations here. I've got the elevons up. Here we're trying to roll left. Here we're trying to roll right. So let's take a look at how air flows over a paper airplane to begin with. Like we did before, I just made a cut that shows this is velocity. We'll make one that shows pressure. So I had one earlier set up because it's a paper airplane and you would expect a large pressure difference on one side or the other. I had to really dial it in and it looks like I don't have that all the way dialed in right now. I'll give a quick try to see if I can pull that back. There we go. You can see, as you'd expect, that the pressure is a little higher below the paper airplane and a little lower above it, which causes a little bit of lift, which holds the paper airplane in the air. So that gives us confirmation that our paper airplane will fly. And I also have another similar way to show that. This is pressure plotted on the surface of the plane. Uh, the lighter yellow, of course, is lower pressure. The darker orange is higher pressure. So there's higher pressure on the bottom, lower pressure on the top. Kind of makes sense. Now I think, oh, didn't like that. What I've done is created a sketch here that tells SolidWorks where to start the flow from. What's last time I did it?
All right, so we will move on to the next uh, option here. And hopefully we get to see the flow here. You can control how many of these um, little dots are created per each line. And I've got, I don't know what the exact number is, but I've got three of them. So you can see how the flow works its way down the plane. It starts out, the air is straight. As it encounters the wing, it begins to curl. And then as it encounters the little flaps on the end here, it curls even more so in this direction or kind of reverses itself and comes back in the other direction. Now I'm actually kind of curious because I haven't done this before. I didn't think about it. Do we see a pressure difference? And we do. You see a higher pressure uh, on the side that has the flap down and a lower pressure on the side that has the flap up, which is, I think, what I'd expect. So that was kind of pleasant. And you'll see the opposite when we roll it left. And just for fun, we can do the, what happens when both of them are there and it's in loop-to-loop -loop mode. Very high pressure region there pushing down, which is what you'd expect if the plane were going to start to climb. Here I've simplified it down into just one line to see how that air behaves. So it encounters the plane, splits over the wings, and then is forced back up by the Elevons or elevators or flaps or whatever you prefer to call them. Well, hold on. <laughs> Here we go. PowerPoint switching back and forth there. Well, I hope you were able to enjoy this brief overview session of SolidWorks Flow. Someone from Fisher Unitech will probably be reaching out to you in the next week if you have any questions. So if you'd like to explore how SolidWorks Flow could improve your design process, what options are available, or to see a custom demo based on your part, please feel free to let them know, or you can reach out to them or to me. Uh, my email address is nsneller at fisherunitech.com. You can find me, Nathan Sneller, on uh, LinkedIn without any issue either.